out into the night. A modern spy thriller for radio by William Keenan, featuring Anna Cropper and John Bennett. Haywood Textiles? Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Haywood hasn't returned yet. This is Miss Wickham, his secretary. Very well. Oh, Mr. Haywood, thank goodness you're back. I didn't realise my protracted lunch would be the cause of such concern, Doris. It's not that you've been a long time for lunch, Mr. Oh, Haywood. Oh, but it is, Miss Wickham. You should take me in hand more. I've been having some very peculiar phone calls. Doris? No, 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 Mr. Haywood. Oh. I'm sorry, Doris, you're really upset. In what way peculiar, then? It's someone who re refuses to leave his name or phone number. <laughs> That's nothing to worry about. He was ringing from Essen, West Germany. Um, if he wouldn't leave his number, how do you know he was ringing from Essen? Well, he said so the first time he rang. He said he was ringing all the way from Essen. It was urgent he should speak to you. I suggested that we could call him back, but his reply was... Well, it was strange. He, he said he couldn't stay where he was. He seemed agitated. Hmm... Could it have any connection with my uh, Dusseldorf trip the day after tomorrow? No. No, it certainly didn't sound like a business call. Whoever it was dialed us direct. He was using a phone box sometimes because I, I heard him put the money in. I got the impression that he was moving about the city from phone box to phone box. And what made you think that? I... Oh, I honestly don't know, Mr. Haywood. Woman's intuition? I can only say that... I sensed that was what he was doing. I know it sounds ridiculous and you probably laugh, but... Well, I, I feel it my duty to tell you how it appeared to me. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Miss Wickham, why not? But my ever-efficient, conscientious Miss Wickham, this intuition of yours seems to run a little amok. What imagination lurks behind those horn-rimmed glasses? You've been reading your mother too many thrillers. I knew that would be your reaction, Mr. Haywood. <clears throat> How is your mother, Doris? Very well. I worry about her getting out of bed into a wheelchair. She shouldn't attempt it when I'm not around. I suppose it's difficult to lie in bed all day. Mm. How does she pass her time when you're not there? Listens to the radio, mostly. As soon as I get home, I read to her. Well, thrillers are her favourites, and occasionally... Mm -hmm. I see you have that knowing look again. I wasn't thinking anything on those lines. I was just noticing that behind your severe facial frontage is a very attractive woman, Miss Wickham. You have been drinking, Mr Haywood. <clears throat> true, true. Um, what was our mysterious caller's last message? That he'll ring again. Then all will be solved soon. Meantime, make a cup of tea. It's the Essen caller, Mr. Haywood. Oh, uh, put him straight through. Hello? Is that Mike? Uh, Michael Haywood, yes. Oh, we are formal. I was wanting to speak to an ex-national serviceman, Squaddy Mike Haywood. <laughs> well, how many, how many years ago is that? Good 15. Don't you recognize me? The voice is very familiar. Dave. Well, Dave Alwyn Thomas. Janker's Dave. None other. <laughs> well, you were always on charges. I knew you'd still remember me. Oh, I could hardly forget. I used to get involved as well. We had a hell of a good time together. Yeah, and you were going to write to me because you decided to stay in Germany. That's right. Yeah, you never did. I lost your address. Uh huh. But now, 15 years later, you found my phone number. Don't be like that, Mike. Hey, do you remember the last time we saw each other? Yeah, very clearly. Uh, 1960. Uh, or was it 61? Well, no matter. It was at an all-night beer festival at that out-of-bounds house in the woods. The place was raided and you were taken away by the military police, shouting, I've got a taxi back tonight. Uh, I escaped and you got detention. Then I was demobbed. I wrote to you from England, but uh, I never got a reply to my letters. Never received them, old man. Unless of your old man. Still fit, then? 
Uh, reasonably. Married? Uh, no, no. Are you? Wish I could be, but too many commitments. You know I'm in business here. What kind of business? Several things. Travel agency, small import business. In fact, I'm in the market for cloth, which is one of the reasons why I'm ringing Hayward Textile Merchants. And um, what are the other reasons, Dave? I could never con you, could I, Mike? You're wondering why the phone call after all these years of silence. Well, the thought has more than just struck me. I can't say much more. I paid for two minutes. I haven't got any more marks to put in. You ring him through a phone box, then? Yes. Well, give me the number. I'll call you back. I can't. Listen carefully, Mark. I'm desperately important that I see you tomorrow. I know you're flying to Dusseldorf in two days. Can you come a day early? There's a seat to spare on tomorrow's flight. I've already checked. I've got a room opposite Essen Railway Station, room 409. I'll repeat it. Will you write it down? Four naught nine. Yeah, just a second while I get a pen. Right, 409. You got it? Yes. Dave, are you in trouble? You might say that. You could get me out of it by just coming here a day early. Would you do that for old time's sake? What kind of trouble? I can't talk about it over the phone. Can you come a day early? If that seat hasn't been taken. You'll get it. Good old Mike. I'll see you have a marvellous time. I'll lay everything on for you. Must go room 409. By the way, the name I'm using is Gibson. David Gibson. Look, Dave. Can't stay a second longer. Hello? Hello, I... Miss Wickham, could you come in a moment? Very good, Mr. Hayward. Well, did you hear any of that conversation? I did, including the reference to a drunken night in the woods and I've got a taxi ah, tonight. Ah, the sins of our youth. Uh, but did you get the hotel? I got the room number, but I didn't take down the name of the hotel. He didn't give the name. All he said was the one opposite the main station. I can easily check that. I suppose you'll want me to change your Dusseldorf flight to tomorrow. If you would. I also took down the name he's using, Gibson. Am I to book you in under an assumed name also? Uh, sarcasm doesn't become you, Miss Wickham. I'm even more disturbed after that last phone call. You seem disturbed by many things today, Miss Wickham. Uh, talking of sarcasm, Mr. Haywood, I noticed then you address me as Miss Wickham. When you want to be nice, it's Doris. Hmm. Well, how about an all-purpose uh, Miss W? And when you're being in your way humorous, I notice that you're usually using it as a way of... Disguising your feelings. How observant of you. Can I speak frankly? Carry on. For months, things have been going wrong, Mr. Haywood. The government contract, that hasn't been paid, and it is causing you a financial headache. But usually they're so prompt. I, I, I can't understand the delay. It's, it's so unlike this government department. Then to say our bill has been misplaced. It can happen with the most efficient of organisations, Miss Wickham. Oh, there you go again. Oh, I'm sorry. I feel something is very wrong, and now you propose to go off all of a sudden to Germany after receiving a strange phone call. I and... am merely going on a business trip a day earlier than planned. To someone you haven't seen for years and who's now using a false name. Well, Dave always was a character. Isn't it also strange that he should know that you're going to Dusseldorf? And by coincidence, Essen happens to be the next city? Hmm. Well, didn't he say he had a travel agency? He most probably came across my name on a passenger list, which would also perhaps give the firm's address. All right. After 15 years, he just happens to come across your name and address. Which is no crime, Miss W. No, but it does suggest caution instead of rushing headlong into something you know so little about. Your concern is most heartwarming, Miss Wickham, but I do know Dave very well. We shared everything for almost 18 months. I got to know him better than a brother. He never let me down. And I won't let him down now. Oh, you talk like a boy scout. Faithfulness is an old-fashioned virtue I greatly admire. Oh, it's ridiculous to take off like this, to become involved in something that... Something that what, Miss Wickham? Something that I sense is wrong. Even the last time you saw him, he was being taken away by the military police under arrest. <laughs> being out of bounds. You make light of everything, but did he or did he not ask to see you to get him out of trouble. Exactly, Miss W. And tomorrow, when I see him, I'll ask him what it's all about, and then I'll ring you back and tell you. I always believe in keeping my secretary fully informed. You're being sarcastic again. All right, then I'll be serious. You're the best secretary I've ever had, and I promise not to undertake anything that might cause you the slightest concern, Doris. In that context, I think a sarcastic Miss Wiggum would have been more appropriate. I'll see about your change of flight. By the way, I wonder if I could uh, leave a few minutes earlier tonight. My mother's sister is staying with us. Oh, by all means. You can go as soon as you've arranged for my change of flight. I'll see you when I get back from Essen. British Airways Flight 824 to Dusseldorf. Will all passengers travelling on this...
is right. Please go now to gate 11. Thank the good Lord that's over. I always say a decade of the rosary on takeoff. Now, where's my handbag? Oh, there it is, just by your feet, Mr... Uh, uh, Haywood. Mrs. O'Connell. Oh. I wonder, Mr. Haywood, if you'd be so kind as to pass me handbag for me. No, not at all. It's a pleasure. Ah, there you are. Oh, that's very kind of you. I'll put me rosary beads away now. Ah, they're serving refreshments. I wasn't sure whether we'd be getting anything to eat or not on such a short flight. Oh, it's long enough by far for me, Mr. Haywood. Though I hate these plastic meals that serve you on aircraft. Good home cooking is what I've been used to. I've brought up a family of seven with never a day passing without bacon bread. And I've never had a tin can in the house. You don't look old enough to have brought up seven children. Oh, for such a compliment you can call me Claire. And what would your first name be, Mr. Haywood? Uh, Michael. A fine name. After Michael the Archangel it is. A great pity I always think that they knocked out that resounding prayer at the end of Mass. Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of battle. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, cast down to hell Satan and all his wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Mm. A fine prayer indeed, when Satan and his spirits are so running rampant in the world. Has a marvellous ring about it, don't you think? Mm, it certainly seems to have. Ah, they're changing everything now. Tea or coffee, madam? How long has the tea been brewed? Oh, freshly made, madam. I'll try the tea, then. I'll have coffee. Are you taking tea or coffee, sir? Oh, freshly brewed. Heaven preserve us. Then why does it taste so stale? I never risk tea outside my home and office. My secretary makes a wonderful cup. Does she know? Are you travelling for the trade fair? Yes. And so am I. I'm demonstrating homespun tweeds at the Irish trade stand. A fearful expense in order that I may weave a few yards of cloth, wouldn't you say, Michael? Oh, and how does the family manage without you? Oh, they're all old enough to look after themselves now. My eldest son is married. When my husband died, our small farm on the west coast passed to him. He's got a good wife. And I... Well, I just felt there was one too many a woman about the place. So when I heard about this demonstrating job, I applied. And I found there weren't many skilled weavers wanting the job of flying round the world to show off their skills. <laughs> the family thought I'd taken leave of me senses. The family are all grown up then? Oh, yes, the youngest 17, Teresa. She's a nurse in England. You just don't look old enough. Children keep you young and active. My mother's 83, and she still helps with the milking, can you believe? And what line are you in, Mr. Haywood? Uh, textiles. Oh, of course, that's why you're here. Are you staying in Dusseldorf? No, Essen. And which hotel will you be staying at there? Um, well, I'm not quite sure of its name. Um, it's the one opposite the railway station. Well, thank you, Mr. Haywood, for helping to make the flight so pleasant. The pleasure was mine. Will uh, anyone be meeting you? And then have a car waiting for me. Well, once again, Mrs. O'Connell, it's a pleasure to have met you. Perhaps we'll bump into one another again in the next few days. I'll be surprised if we don't, Mr. Haywood. Good day, General. Good day. Attention, please. Will passenger Mr. Michael Haywood, newly arrived on British Airways flight 824, go to the British Airways office? Passenger Mr. Michael Haywood, newly arrived on British Airways Can I help you, sir? Uh, this is the British Airways office. Yes, sir. Ah, my name is Haywood. I was Tannoy a few moments ago. Ah, yes, sir. We have a taxi waiting for you. A taxi? To take you to Essen. But I didn't order any taxi. The driver's here waiting for you. Mr. Haywood? Yes? I was instructed to take you to the Hotel Kelhoof. 
And where is that prey? In Essen. It is facing the station. Oh, well, that seems to be the one. Let's go. You do not mind the radio? Uh, not if it's turned down a little. Who instructed you to take me to the hotel? Uh, Mr. Gibson? I do not know. It was a call to the office. I can find out for you when I return uh, later. No, it doesn't matter. How long will it take us to get to Essen? We will be there by a quarter to two. Ja, Sie haben es gut. Um 8 Uhr. Danke schön. Guten Tag. Haben Sie ein Zimmer? Uh, ja, danke. Are you are English? Yes. Uh, my name is Haywood. I believe my secretary made a reservation for me yesterday. Uh, that is correct, sir. Welcome to Essen. Thank you. Room 308. It is at the front. But in all fairness, sir, I must warn you about the noise. We are making a new underground railway and working day and night. Oh. Does the work go on all night? Yes, though we have recently protested and have been assured that the noises machinery will not be used until dawn. Oh, well, that's some consolation. Do you still want your room? Uh, yes, and thank you for the warning. Oh, I wonder if you could let a friend who's staying here know that I've arrived. Certainly, sir. What is the name of your friend? Gibson. David Gibson. Gibson, sir? I don't think we have any gentleman of that name staying here. Uh, but one moment, sir. I will make sure... Your friend is uh, English? Yes. Hmm. Gibson. Gibson. No. We have no one of that name, sir. But he rang me only yesterday to say he was definitely staying here. He even gave me the room number. Room 409. There is no Mr. Gibson in room 409, sir. What is your friend like in appearance? Well, it's quite some time since I saw him. Um, but he's well built. Broad. And has ginger hair that comes to a tuft at the front. I can assure you, he is not the gentleman in 409. He, too, is English, but uh, he has grey hair, a grey cavalry moustache, and is in his mid-60s. Oh, that's definitely not my friend. He was never cavalry. Well, I can only think he booked a room and then had to cancel it. I have been in charge of the reception desk all this week, sir. I can assure you most positively that we have not had any booking by or for a Mr. Gibson. We do not have a great many Englishmen staying here, and I have an excellent memory for names and faces, sir. I, um, I wonder if he could have booked under another name. Uh, another name, sir? Yeah, Thomas, for example. Uh, David Alwyn Thomas. You see, he sometimes uses the family name on his mother's side. He's Welsh, you know. I do not understand how you mean, sir. Uh, yes, well, it is a bit complicated, granted. So it seems, uh, but we have no Mr. Thomas either. Something must have delayed him then. Well, I'm sure he'll be getting in touch soon. I will personally attend to any call from a Mr. Gibson or a Mr. Thomas, sir. Thank you. The boy will take your bags to the room. Reception, please. Uh, reception? Yes, sir. Uh, Haywood, room 308. Are you sure there haven't been any calls for me? None at all, Mr. Haywood. I've been sitting here by this damn phone for more than four hours now. I, I can't understand what's happened. My friend led me to understand he was staying in room 409. Has anyone from that room been asking for me? From 409, sir? No, there have been no calls from 409, to my knowledge. I don't think there's anyone in the room at present, sir. <sighs> Can I suggest that you have dinner? And if he comes or rings in the next half hour, so we will come to the dining room for you. The dining room is on the first floor, sir. <laughs> Do you mind if I join you? Uh, no, not at all. Thank you. Have you ordered? Not yet. Ah, the view is excellent. I had it for dinner last night. There is also an extremely good hawk. I am going to order a full bottle if you would join me. Well, that's very kind of you. The name is Malakev Boris. <laughs> Uh, Russian. <laughs> yes, but please, do not think I am, how do you say, um, bogeyman or something. <laughs> I am here with the trade delegation. At the Dusseldorf Trade Fair. Uh, yes, but the hotels in Dusseldorf were all booked, so I was sent here. You two at the trade fair? Yes. In textiles? Yes, see you. 
Uh, tell me, as a cloth merchant, uh, what lines are you Russians really interested in? Oh, we don't know ourselves. We are just uh, observers. But I am not going to ask you any more questions. Otherwise, you will think I am spying. <laughs> you Westerners are so suspicious. Well, not without reason, perhaps. I did not hear that remark, Mr. Haywood. <laughs> so, we will have a good meal, good wine, and a pleasant evening. Eh? Uh, you look surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I am. I have a feeling someone's following me. No, not I, I assure you, Hill. No, no, not you. An Irish lady. Ah, an Irish lady. Dark hair, striking features, a passionate race that have suffered misery under British capitalist imperialism. She happens to be a widow with seven grown-up children and perfectly content. Or so she informed me. Ah, yes. She must have been a striking beauty in her youth. <laughs> Still a fine figure of a woman. You must introduce me. It would appear she'll be introducing herself. Ah, Mr. Haywood. I remembered you said you were staying here. And when the gentleman decided on a night's drinking, I suddenly had the idea of coming over. <laughs> staying in a strange hotel room's a bit lonely, so I came on the off chance. I hope you don't mind, now. Please join us. Uh, please. Uh, Mrs. Claire O'Connell, Comrade Boris Balakin. <gasps> He's not a Russian. I am, dear lady. Shame on you, sir. You not allowing people the freedom of conscience to quietly practice their faith. What's the good of having a full belly if you're denied and starved spirituality? Lenin said it ought to be left up to the individual to choose. So why can't you let him? My dear lady, we are going to have good wine, good food, and no politics tonight. Eh? <laughs> be seated and I shall order for us. Did you enjoy as you mean? It was excellent, and so was the wine. Uh, would you like anything else? Will the Irish lady have a vodka with me? I certainly will not. Oh, come now, Mrs. O'Connell. And you, such a splendid, mature example of your race. And I'll have none of your blarney and impertinence, Comrade Balakov. <laughs> that is the trouble with the Cold War. It stops warm friendships developing, huh? I would. You will drink with me. Waiter, what is there for my capitalist English friend? A brandy to finish? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, later, I may have a glass of your German beer. I am Italian, sir. Hmm? Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> About the kitchen, we are all Italians or Spanish now in Germany. They are so short of people for everything. Now many Turks are coming in. Yeah, to keep going the German economic miracle because of the declining German numbers. Yes, a lesson here for capitalism. The richer a nation gets, the faster its population declines. Uh, waiter, have there been any messages for me? None at all. You seem worried, Haywood? Yes, an old friend of mine from years back said he'd see me here, and he hasn't arrived. Oh, I regret to hear that. But I am very glad your Mrs. O'Connell turned up. I wonder if you'd be good enough to see me to a taxi, Michael. Oh, certainly. Yes. I was hoping I could show you the sights of Essen, Mrs. O'Connell. Saints preservers. Me painting the town red with a Russian. Then at least allow me to escort you to a taxi. Or are you afraid? I don't trust you Russians as far as I could throw you. And you a big hefty fella at that. <laughs> but afraid I'm not. Then let me find you a taxi, Claire O'Connell. No, 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 no. I insist. Mrs. O'Connell to you, Comrade Balakif. Oh, very well, then. It is getting late. Mrs. O'Connell, then it will be. I think tomorrow I must pay my respects to your glorious trade delegation in the hope that they are willing to exchange Irish whiskey for vodka. <laughs> well, will you excuse me, Michael? Of course. Ah, a breath of fresh air help to sober him. Good night, Michael. Uh, yes, of course. Good night. Uh, waiter. Are you sure there have been no messages? Quite sure, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry to have been such a nuisance. I'm going out for a short walk and a drink. Half an hour at the most. If anyone calls, if, would If uh, Mr. Thomas or Mr. Gibson come, I will get them to wait for you. Or if they ring, I will get the number so you can ring back. Look, on second thoughts, I won't go out. I'll wait in my room in case there's a call. And I can have an early night. Oh, oh. I didn't know 
Somebody said the worst machinery wasn't used. Hello, Haywood. Mr. Haywood? Yes? Please, can you come here quickly to reception? Mm, what was it? At nearly three o'clock in the morning? It's one of your countrymen. But what is? There's been an accident. Accident? Yeah, he must have fallen from his window. Please, quickly. He's asking for an Englishman to speak with. I'll be right down. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Let me through, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, you, Haywood. Yes. Lean over closer. No one else must hear us. Save your strength. There's an ambulance on the way. I have something I must say. Closer, closer. Do you read? Do I read? Poetry. Well, I used to. I... It's so late in... in... What's so late? In... in, in to the night. <coughs> Avro? <coughs> Avro? No. <coughs> A rose? No. A rose. <coughs> He has lost consciousness. Look, ask the crowd to stand back. The ambulance is here now. Ask the crowd to stand back. He wants to tell me something. It's no good now. He's too far gone. Well, I must try again. What is it you want to tell me? The ambulance men are Just here. one moment. What do you want to tell me? I think he's dead. No, he's still breathing. Let them get him to hospital. Shall I tell the ambulance man that you want to go with him, Mr. Hedwood? Yes. But you're not a relation. No, you better tell me who he is. Uh, Mr. Robson has been staying at the hotel for more than a week now. In the room you thought your friend had booked in. What? Which room? Room 409. Mr. Hayward... I must apologize for bringing you to Essen Police Station. I do not often get the opportunity of speaking to an Englishman, and I would be grateful if you would correct my grammar. I must make full use of the opportunity offered. Well, your English is excellent, and you have the advantage of me. Uh, we haven't met. Of course. You must again excuse me, Mr. Hayward. Uh, my name is Meyer, Inspector Meyer. Uh, please sit down. Oh, thank you. To admit you. Uh, well, now, the pleasantries are over, Inspector Meyer. Would you uh, be kind enough to tell me why I've been brought here? Oh, but of course. I simply want you to tell me about Mr. Robson. Oh, first, you gave me the impression you only wanted an English grammar lesson. I appreciate your English humour, Mr. Hayward. I spent several years as a student in England, which is why I'm fascinated by all things English, even their little idiosyncrasies. I'm fascinated by your command of English. May I compliment you on its excellence? With such talent, I'm surprised you're just an ordinary policeman. I did not say I was an ordinary policeman. Though, on the subject of ordinariness, you would hardly appear to be an ordinary businessman. Then appearances are deceptive, to quote an English expression. You are the managing director of Hayward Textiles. And that's all I am. And you are here for a business conference? Correct. In Dusseldorf? Uh, yes. But you are in Essen. And you are a day early. Which I am not disputing. And then can you tell me why you are in Essen and a day early? I plan to meet a friend. A friend who may be using aliases Thomas or Gibson? I wouldn't know. But those are the names you suggested he might be using. Uh, one of these idiosyncrasies you mentioned. Mr. Hayward, I am no longer a mule. Neither am I, Inspector. When you arrived at the hotel, you told the receptionist your friend was in room 409. He wasn't. But the man who was, an Englishman to stretch the coincidence even further, falls or was pushed from the window of that very room, room 409. Badly injured and semi-conscious, he asked for only one person. You, Mr. Hayward. Why? I don't know. Mr. Hayward, I don't take you for a stupid man. Such an obvious lie hardly becomes you. You earlier asked for the person in room 409, then he asks for you. And now you try to pretend ignorance of everything. But the assumption is obvious. 
you knew each other. You intended to contact one another. The first time I met Mr. Robson was when he was lying injured. That is the truth. What did he so urgently want to convey to you, Mr. Hayward? You, a complete stranger. Well, he was rambling. He didn't make sense. Just exactly what did he say? Surely the words of a man so badly injured would stay in your mind. <sighs> You'll never believe this, Inspector, but he asked me if I read poetry. Again, I am not amused. Truth is stranger than fiction, to quote another English expression. Maya, ja. Hm. Danke schön. Mr. Robson has died. I'm now treating this as a murder inquiry. And unless you start giving me some straightforward answers to my questions, you could find yourself detained here for some considerable time. Now, Mr. Hayward, could you start again at the very beginning? Uh, Hayward, how are you? Oh, fine, fine. My name's Crawley, Charles Crawley. I'm representing the embassy. I've sprung you, old man. And there's even a car waiting to take you back to the hotel. Oh, I'd prefer to be taken out of the country after the grilling I've had. Unfortunately, that won't be possible. The German police are insisting you remain in the country. But we'll do everything we can for you, of course. Oh, I don't know whether that produces comfort or more concern. I would have thought that being helped by the embassy was a great source of comfort. You're attached to the embassy now? Well, not exactly. More with the consulate. You see, I'm also a director of an advertising agency here in Essen. Oh, how's business? Thriving, old man. I wish I could say the same. But I recently ran into financial problems that I now don't believe were coincidence. Oh. I'm almost convinced they were contrived. Contrived? I don't understand, old man. I think you understand far more than I do, Mr. Crawley. The car is waiting, you know. So now I'm staying at a country mansion, am I? Inside quickly. Why, are we late for an appointment? As a matter of fact, you are. I expected you earlier. My name's Robson. And this nice little place in the woods is yours, I presume. Also this friendly hound? You presume correctly. Rufus is reasonably friendly. I'm also correct, am I, in presuming that we're somewhere on the outskirts of Dusseldorf? You are. It's so pleasant to meet someone who's so communicative. Oh, do come in. Port, sherry, brandy or whiskey? Nothing at all. You surprise me. Mm, not as much as you surprise me. I didn't know the British played cowboys like the CIA and the KGB. With me, a gun pointing at my stomach induces a queasy but definitely uncooperative feeling deep down. All the more reason to have a drink? All the more reason not to. As you wish. Uh, Crawley? Whiskey. With your usual Americanized ice and water. If you don't mind. He's never got over his liaison work with the CIA. Uh, take a seat, Haywood. Oh, I uh, wasn't planning on staying. <laughs> I like a sense of humour. But do sit down. I have a proposition to put to you. I'd prefer to get back to my hotel. I have a busy day ahead of me. Uh, first of all, let me say how sorry we are to hear about your financial problems. Uh, we? Our organisation, that is. We have managed to get you out of a German police cell, and it would appear your financial problems could also be solved. Oh, how? In return for your cooperation. Doing what? Oh, staying around. And? Keeping an eye open for your ex-army friend, David Thomas. Why? Because he has certain information a government department would like to see. It uh, may seem an elementary question, but uh, in these days of double-agent gambits, do you mind telling me which government? 
Her Majesty's government. And how do I know? Simple answer is you don't. But some information I will give you. The man you had dinner with last night, who calls himself Boris Balakev, is to be avoided. He's a KGB colonel. Ordinary trade delegates are accompanied everywhere by their secret police. For one of them to be allowed to dine alone with you is such a rarity that it only becomes a senior KGB man. So, the name of the game? Intelligence. Spy. Call it what you will. Am I correct in thinking my friend Dave is a spy? Or is there another synonym for it? Um, intelligence agent? How about intelligence representative? Yes, I'd rather go for that. I gather you don't think very highly of this branch of the service. Oh, that's even better. This branch of the service. Uh, no, frankly, I don't. Then we know where we stand. Uh, then do you mind if I go? I do mind. I insist you hear me out. Tell me, then, if you're called Robson, and the man who fell out of the hotel... We're not was... related. Robson just happens to be a, well, rather a common name. It makes me wonder if they thought they were killing you. Or whether you did the killing. Or another branch of the service, perhaps? Look, I don't want to be mixed up in this, Robson. No, pity. I've got some news for you. Your creditors are about to move in. If they do, your family firm is finished. And what then will happen to Miss Wickham and her mother? Don't you feel you have a duty to your employees? Especially when it can be so easily rectified. How? Just stay around until tomorrow and see. Crawley will take you back to your hotel. We'll be in touch. Well, as I have to stay around anyway for the benefit of the German police, what have I got to lose? Exactly. I'm sure you'll find tomorrow will be a much brighter day, Haywood. Now, won't you have that drink? Uh, no, thanks. Strong-willed? Stubborn? Or oh, which cinnamon would you prefer in your case? Still suspicious. I can't understand why. Oh, uh, talking of tomorrow, uh, will you be going to the other Mr. Robson's funeral? Or do you think the German police might be filming the mourners? Good night, Mr. Robson. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Haywood. Your coffee, sir. Ah, thank you. Uh, just put it down there. I, I want to have a shave first. Very good, sir. Uh, would you close the door? Uh, but there is someone here, sir. A Fräulein, sir. Doris. What the hell are you doing here? But you're, you're all right. Well, did you expect otherwise? I, I, I was told that there'd been an accident. Uh, who told you about that? Well, a gentleman came round to the house last night and said that you'd been involved in an accident. Well, he brought a, a nurse for my mother and there was a car to take me to the airport... Oh, I, I thought it was an emergency. I thought something terrible had happened to you. Who was the gentleman? Uh, Mr Anderson. I, I thought he was a, an official of some kind. Yes, well, there, there was an accident yesterday, and uh, an Englishman was involved. They must have got his name mixed up with mine. Oh, it's most probably an error by the consulate. You sound as if you're trying to reassure me that everything's all right when it isn't. Well, some secretaries know their bosses too well for them to be taken in so easily. So true. Uh, tell me, Doris, what time did this Mr. Anderson come to your house? About 10.30. Last night? Yes. You look surprised. The accident hadn't happened then. Not until five hours later. What? What's it all about, Mr. Haywood? I wish I knew. Well, why bring me over here? Mr. Haywood, I I'm frightened. Yes, well, pour the coffee before it goes cold. Uh, and you better ring for another cup. Very good, Mr. Haywood. And Doris... Stop worrying. And it was only yesterday I was thinking how much better things were. How do you mean? Well, two of the biggest outstanding debts were paid together. Both cheques arrived in the second post. Hmm. The accountant will be delighted. Well, I thought you would have been too. Yesterday, before I learned a few modern facts of life, I might have been. Today, I see things in a new light. Well, whatever does that mean? That today, you are going back. Oh, no, I'm not, Mr. Haywood. There's something very peculiar going on, and I'd feel happier staying here and seeing that you're all right. Your coffee. Mm. What about you? I'll ring for another cup, as you said, Mr. Haywood. Oh, it's all right. I'll see to it. Good morning, Mr. Haywood. Crawley. You 
don't seem very pleased to see me. Do come in. Have you brought me another invitation? I have, as a matter of fact. Now, you won't have met my secretary, Miss Wickham. Miss Wickham, this is Mr Crawley. He was good enough last night to arrange an introduction with a prospective customer. How good of him. Mm. We're meeting again this morning. Uh, Mr Crawley also runs an advertising agency in Essen. How interesting. Mm. And he's also attached to the consulate. An extremely busy man. And a most persuasive manner with him. I didn't know your secretary was with you. She wasn't. But she made a surprise visit. Uh, do you think I ought to take her with me to this next meeting? I thought it was meant to be an informal get-together. I wouldn't think you'd be needing your secretary. No, I thought she might take a few notes on what we discuss. Do you feel that is really necessary? Well, I was just wondering what the form was. Uh, by the way, would you use your influence to get her a nearby room? I'm sure I shall be able to help. I'm sure you will. In fact, while you're finishing dressing, I'll have a word with reception. You know, I don't think Miss Wickham need accompany you on this visit. You won't be too long, will you? The car's waiting outside. This way, we've come round the back and through the garage this time. More cloak and daggerage, I suppose. In daylight, it is less conspicuous and therefore safer. I suppose this is lesson number one. If you've decided to cooperate. Oh, I might even have a drink this time. Now, what'll it be? A glass of the best local wine. Well, then I'll have one with you. I'm afraid we won't be able to tempt Crawley from his Americanized iced whiskey. They ice everything. The Americans, I mean. Will you join us in a glass of hock, Crawley? I prefer my whiskey and ice, if you don't mind. Very good. One iced whiskey. Thank you. Now, Haywood, it's not really local, but it's a hock I think you might like. Steinberger Cabinet. It's from a 70-acre vineyard planted by monks in the 12th century. Even now they lay the wines to mature in the ancient Kloster Eberbach Monastery. I'm not a Christian myself, but I feel we owe so much to them. Oh, it would be virtually impossible to be a Christian in your line of business, I should think. Ethics are essential in everything. In spying, that human virtue, loyalty, is so much appreciated by both sides. And both sides tend to punish the transgressors. Here we are. A state-bottled stats domain. Both sides also tend to bump off their defectors. Oh, crudely, yes. How can you have ethics when you're considering the pros and cons of obliterating a former colleague? But can't a man, by his own action, deprive himself of the right of life? Your wine. Thank you. Cheers. To our long association. I prefer fruitful association. <laughs> Mocking though you may be, I'll drink to that. Cheers. Now to the business in hand. As you may know, your business problems have been taken care of, and your cash flow is quite healthy. Now that you've opened the dam you built, you'll be more than recompensed for your trouble. But if I hadn't agreed, I'd have been bankrupt. Last night you said that very thing yourself. You're making it very difficult, Haywood. I intend to. Peace comes after conflict. Why should we be in conflict? Because you nearly bankrupted me. I'm supposed to be grateful now, am I, because you removed the obstacle you first put there? Well, I'm not. What can I do, then? I'll tell you. As a businessman, I'm going to talk business. You want me to do something that's very important to you, or you wouldn't have gone to all this trouble. Last night, you found an excuse to even bring my secretary over. Because she's a good cover for you, boss and his secretary. I don't want her involved. Ah, she already is. She can't be taken back now, or it looks suspicious. Why should a boss send for his secretary for just a few minutes' conversation? The return airfare wouldn't justify it. But a boss would be delighted to have his secretary around in important business negotiations, which also mean important letters being sent out giving details of whatever is being offered. He would find her invaluable for his urgent correspondence. <laughs> You're as cold as the ice in Crawley's whiskey, Robson. Cold and calculating. I just appreciate the facts of life. You're ruthless. That's what I'm paid for. So was Himmler. I'm amazed that, feeling as you do, you want to work for us. You give me little choice. You can have my loyalty, Robson, but don't expect devotion. 
What else can I expect? A job well done? After a wasteful youth, I've found that one of the great joys in living is in finishing things. Any job finished brings human joy, a Spanish philosopher once said. Even a do-it-yourself job, when completed, brings great satisfaction. So I'll try to finish this thing for you, whatever it is. Yes, I think you will, Haywood. So what do you want me to do? Merely to stay around and look for your friend Dave, as any old friend would. Oh, come, surely it's more than that. No, no, just that. You see, Haywood, in this game, everyone knows everyone else. We know the Russians and their setup, and they know ours, as we do Peking and the Americans. For want of a better word, you're clean. You're not known. You're what you are, a genuine textile wholesaler. Any checks by them, and they do check our cover firms, will produce the genuine article. That'll give us the time we need. For what? And the less you know, the longer you'll stay alive, Haywood. The only other information I will give you is that your friend Dave has the best chance if you cooperate. Crawley will be your contact, and this is a number to ring in an emergency. Now, is there anything else? Yes. The fee for my services and risking my life. Oh, I'm sure that can be taken care of. But I'm a businessman. I've weighed up the situation, and now I know the value of my services. Which is what? Twenty thousand pounds paid into my account before <laughs> I begin. Ridiculous. Is it? You know it is. On the contrary. For all the trouble you've taken to involve me and my secretary, I'm sure I'm worth every penny. I don't intend to move or do anything until the money's paid in. Obviously, you're not going to tell me everything, but it's something very big. And I'm going to be risking my life. So, I'm doing it for two reasons. For my old friend Dave, whom you so cleverly used, and for my business. Well, you've heard my going price, and you can take it or leave it. You've exaggerated the importance of this thing. In that case, we're wasting each other's time. Now, wait a minute. This wine's rather good, Robson. Uh, what did you say the name of it was? Steinberger Cabinet. Yes, I must remember to get some on my way back to the hotel. You can ring me there and uh, let me know your decision. As an old friend, you could start by going to Dave's travel agency. As an old friend, you could also borrow his Jaguar. I'm sure he must have said you could borrow his car when he rang you. Not that I recall. Mm. Then it must have been an oversight on his part. Another glass of hock. I love one. Oh, it's you, Mr. Hayward. Well, what's that you've got? A bottle of Steinberger Cabinet. Because I think we've landed a rather large order. Well, from whom? Another government contract, Doris. Well, I hope the delay in payment isn't as long as the last one. No, month. Doris. I'm now learning the best way of dealing with this government department. They're even paying in advance. <laughs> You're pulling my leg again, Mr. Hayward. Get the glass or glasses from the bathroom and let's have a drink. Afterwards, I want to see if my old friend Dave is at his travel agency. I thought he arranged to meet you here. Yes, he was delayed. I must find out when he's due back. Have you got the glasses? I can only find one. We could share it. Good morning. Good morning. I'm an old friend of Mr. David Thomas. He was supposed to meet me last night at the Hotel Kelhoff. Mr. Thomas is away on business still. But he definitely agreed to be there. Surely there's a message for me here. Look, my name is Haywood. I'm a good friend of Mr. Thomas. So am I. What of that, Mr. Haywood? We'd arranged to meet last night, but he didn't arrive. I think you'd better come through to the flat. Please make yourselves at home, Mr. Haywood. What a beautiful flat Mr. Thomas has. I designed it for him. The trouble is, he is here so seldom. Oh? He travels a great deal. I wish he wouldn't. I want him to settle down. I want to settle down with him. I want him to marry me. <laughs> you look surprised, Mr. Haywood. Oh, well, I, I didn't mean to. Most people are. What is the English word for it? Vamp, I think. I look a vamp, a good time girl, no? Um, well stacked would be the polite English expression. But I want to have babies and a husband who comes home and sits and chats with me. Men never want to make conversation with me because I am, uh, how do you say it? Uh, well stacked? Well stacked. Yeah. They just look on me and well stacked women like me as instruments for their pleasure. 
The mind and the soul are far more important, don't you think? Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, um, Helga. Helga. The, I understand Dave arranged me to borrow his Jaguar while I'm here. You look worried. The mention of the Jaguar makes me worried. It makes me also wonder if you are his friend. Well, because I want to borrow his car? No, but because so many people want to have that Jaguar. Already there have been two attempts to steal it since last night. Oh, why is that? With you being interested in the car, I thought you would be able to tell me, Mr. Haywood. Well, I can only assure you that I'm a good friend of David's. Since we were in the forces here together. I think David would prefer me to have the car than anyone else. And you say he rang you and asked you to come? Yes. My secretary here took the call. Well, that's correct, Helga. He rang several times because Mr. Haywood was out at lunch. I also made a note that he wanted Mr. Haywood to meet him last night at the hotel opposite the station. In fact, I, I have my notebook here in my bag, if you wish to... I believe you. And you may take the car. Here are the keys. Thank you. I'll arrange for some uh, short-term insurance. Have you heard from him at all since you arrived in Germany? No. Have you in the last few days? No, and I'm afraid. What of? I don't know, but something tells me David is in grave trouble. I, I think there's a car following us, Mr. Haywood. Uh, I've been watching it through my mirror for some time, Doris. Is that why you're making for the autobahn? The car that's been following us all these miles is quite inconspicuous. Deliberately so. Well, let's see what their not very noticeable car makes of this. Mr. Haywood, you're, you're going over 90. 100, Doris. 105. 10. Mr. Haywood, I, I'm scared. Please. 15. Oh. 120. They're fast disappearing out of sight, Doris. Look round and tell me when all the cars behind us have disappeared from view. You frightened the daylights out of me, Mr. Haywood. Yes, but we lost that car. Oh, oh, what a lovely day. I just feel like picking those wildflowers in the field over there. Aren't they pretty? Well, why don't you? Well, what are you going to do, Mr. Haywood? Examine the car. But whatever for? Your car's like this one, isn't it? Yes. And as a Jaguar owner, there's one place I would hide things that only a Jaguar owner would know where to look. You mean you think that the people trying to steal it were looking for something here in the car? See if the handbook is in the glove compartment. This is a later model of mine, but I should imagine the fuse is still in the same place. Yes, Mr. Haywood. Jaguar Operating Maintenance and Service Handbook. Yeah, that's the one. Look up fuses in the index. Page 72, fuses. Ah, here. Yeah. The fuses are located behind the instrument panel and access to them is obtained by removing the two instrument panel retaining screws, top left and right hand corners. Which are here and here. You unscrew that one, Doris. I'll do this one. I always thought that this was solid wood, especially with all those instruments being in it. Exactly. And um, hey, presto. Well, what's all the wiring? Circuits and fuses. Now. Now, oh, what's this? How did you know there would be anything behind that little tube? That little tube was a fuse, Doris. It's just that if I had an English car like this and wanted to hide something that would be difficult for foreigners to find but where a person familiar with this type of car would look, then this is the place. What's that piece of paper wrapped round the little tube? That we shall soon find out. First remove the fuse. So. It's a very small piece of paper. But big enough for an address. Langerman Antique Books. Essen. Well, to find the road or street, we just need a phone book. Yeah, there's something else on the back. But it's so minute, I can hardly read it. And the first word looks like late. Yes, and the last is night. But I can't make out the two words in between. I think I can guess them. Into the... Late into the night. Whatever does it mean? Late into the night. I wonder, Doris... I wonder. 
Yes, you speak English. Uh, we have many English clients. It was one of your English clients, a friend of mine, who recommended you. Oh, very good. I'd like to speak to the proprietor about purchasing a rare book. Oh, my husband, Herr Langerman, is the proprietor, but he is away on business. Uh, can I help you, sir? I'm sure you can. Uh, what is the title of this rare book you wish to purchase? Oh, I'm not buying, I'm selling. Uh, the book belongs to my friend, uh, Mr. Thomas. It's a book on poetry containing a fascinating item called Late Into the Night. I'm afraid I don't understand. From your rather startled expression, I thought you did understand all too well. If this is an English practical joke... Let me give joke... you the punchline, then. On this slip of paper is my phone number and the price I require. Twenty thousand pounds? Mm, I'm finding it an almost standard fee these days. And by the way... There are other interested purchases, Mrs. Lagerman. Good day. Your room key, Mr. Haywood? Please. Are there any messages for me? Your secretary, Miss Wickham, asked me to let you know she has gone shopping. She's in the next room, 307, which was requested by Mr. Crawley. Oh. No adjoining doors, I hope? Uh, no, sir. Crawley. Well, you gave me a shock sitting there. Crawley? Are you all right? Good Lord. Hello, I want to speak to Robson. Robson speaking, Haywood. Crawley is in my room. He has a neat hole in his head, and he's clutching the Oxford Book of English Verse. How bad is he? Well, let's say he'll never need another iced whiskey. Then I would advise you to go to the Café Garten immediately, Haywood. Coffee. Left. Ah, Mr. Haywood! Balaka! Yes, and with your good Irish lady. Ah. Ah, as you will perceive, she has taken up my offer to show her our lesson. In broad daylight to be on the safe side. <laughs> well, I understand that you were too modest the other night, Colonel. That you're no ordinary trade delegate. Your freedom of movement is unusual for a textile technician. Uh, though I noticed the other night when I brought up the subject of textiles, you uh, immediately veered away from it. My capitalist friend, I will confess to you that my knowledge of textiles is very limited, and sometimes people come as delegates who shouldn't. I am one of them. What's this you two are on about? Mr. Haywood appears to have been checking my credentials. Good for him. Who told you I was a colonel? Uh, someone made a point of telling me, uh, without any questions from me, that I should stay clear of you, as you're thought to be a KGB colonel. But lack of your villain, you're a persecutor. Ah, uh, slanders to ruin whatever affection a good Irish woman may have for me. Then you've lost nothing on that score. Ah, <laughs> Mrs. O'Connell, you remind me of my first wife. You mean she'd no affection for you either? <laughs> And how's your present wife? Like you, Mrs. O'Connell, I too have suffered bereavement, and apart from three children, I am alone. A likely story. <laughs> A pity. No one believes the truth these days. So, ah, thank you, waiter. Come on, Colonel. I want to get back to my hotel before dark. So you don't want the coffee, and you don't like my company. Let's go, then. We bid you a good day, Mr. Haywood. Goodbye, now. You can, I hope, admire the beautiful flowers, Mr. Haywood. Mrs. O'Connell. Mr. Haywood. Doris. What the hell are you doing here? You're not one of them, are you? One of them, Mr. Haywood? Well, I just don't know who to trust, Doris. Oh, Mr. Haywood, what have I done? Well, how did you know to come here? Well, a man, an, an, an Englishman, stopped me in the street and told me you wanted me, and he, he directed me here. Well, they were obviously following you. Who was following me? Well, government employees, I suspect. <laughs> Checking on the currency we're spending. Is that what they're doing? Uh, yes, could very well be. Uh, here, have this coffee. It's just been brought. M Mr. Haywood. What is it? That man. Uh, w walking past the kiosk there. Well, he, he was the one who told me to come here. Oh, he's coming this way. To us? Most probably going to buy us a coffee, Doris. Uh, Mr. Haywood? It is. 
Oh, my name is Robson. Oh, such a common name around here. Uh, this is my secretary, Miss Doris Wickham. How do you do? My first name's Jim, by the way. Look, can I get you a coffee or a beer? Oh, I've, I've just got one, thank I'll you. I'll have a beer with you, Jim. Waiter, two beers, please. Yes, sir. I understand you directed my secretary here, Jim. <laughs> yes. How did you know where to find me? I was told you would be coming and to arrange for Miss Wickham to meet you. And I suppose your instructions came from a mutual friend of ours? Your supposition is quite correct. Hmm. Ah, here come the beers. So. Thank you. Did you know that this place lets you buy the beer mugs? Quite attractive, aren't they? Uh, cheers. Cheers. I wouldn't mind buying a beer mug. How much would it cost? Oh, a few mugs. Oh. I'll have a couple. I should make quite a profit if I pull off a book deal I'm working on. I beg your pardon? Oh, just a little business I'm undertaking. You'll arrange for the beer mugs? Oh, yes. Good. Now, what else will you be doing for us? Taking you back to your hotel in a few minutes. Hmm, so the room's been spring cleaned already? I don't believe it has, Mr. Haywood. Spring clean? An extra service I didn't know existed till I came here, Doris. Well, the place looks all shipshape. I would hardly describe it as being spring clean. Though someone has been busy cleaning. There's water been spilled near the chair. It's still wet. Uh, what a bargain these beer mugs were. Uh, come in, Robson. We can have a drink. I don't think I've got time, Mr. Haywood. Must be on my way. Though, before I go... Yes? I was asked to collect a book left by your last visitor. Which last visitor? Um, the one you rang the other Mr. Robson about. But I was told to leave everything as it was and go for a coffee. Uh, to the place where I met you, in fact. Uh, but, but the book wasn't left here. Wasn't it? What is all this about? What book? Who was the mysterious visitor you kept to yourself? What's going on between you? Ask Mr. Robson. Well, Mr. Robson? As I said, I don't have time to stay. I must be on my way. Uh, thanks for the lift uh, and the beer mugs. Don't mention it. Mr. Haywood, you are behaving very strangely. Having worked for you for so long, I know when you pretend to be a little mystified about something that you're covering up. Whatever do you mean, Doris? That you know where the book is. Walls have ears, Doris. And that man we've just met was sinister. He could pass for a hired assassin. It's amazing, the people you meet abroad these days. And that's another method you have of covering up, making light of things. You know me so well, Doris, that I think if everything works out, I ought to marry you. Mr Haywood... Do you know what worried me most when the firm was in danger of going under? What was it, Mr Haywood? That you'd be leaving, and that I might not see you again. I realised I'd miss you very much. I began analysing why I hadn't married. I suppose it was coming from a broken home. Oh. And an attractive woman like you must also have a reason for not marrying. You never asked me. Look, I've got that big house in Brummel. I have a daily help whom I'm sure would be delighted to look after your mother. Take your glasses off, Doris, and come here. But, but Mr Haywood... But Mr Haywood, nothing. Mr Haywood... Uh... I knew you could kiss like that. In modern parlance, do you fancy me, Doris? I always have, Mr. Haywood. Always worshipped you from afar. From too far. You should have given me some indication. You shouldn't have been so blind, were my glasses. <laughs> and it would have to be till death to us part. Nothing in between. <laughs> Wonderful. And I would insist on being married by a priest at Mass. My convent education. Haywood speaking. I believe you have a book of poetry for sale. That's correct. I am representing Herr Langerman. When can we see it? Uh, I haven't got it with me. It's being carefully preserved. I need 24 hours. 24 hours, then. I will call you again. Ah, never a dull moment. I think it's time we went for another drive, Doris. First, you go off suddenly left, like this, right across the track. And then you go first right down a side street. Then left, and first right again, and continue weaving your way through side streets. Anything following? Not that I can see. Two more turns and we'll soon be certain. 
It's a method the KGB teach. And one more to the right. And no car is following us. Even if someone was following us at the beginning of the manoeuvre, he soon realises what's happening, that he hasn't a cat in hell's chance of not giving himself away. So he gives up. It's stupid to try to keep close contact because another method is for the leading car to drive into a dead end and when the following car is lured in, a third car then seals off the exit. Like me, you read too many thrillers. You're obviously revelling in mm, it. Cowboys and Indians all over again. No, aren't you going to tell your future wife what's happening? You know, you haven't called me Mike yet. After calling you Mr. Haywood all these years, it's, it's going to be rather difficult. Mike. <laughs> there, I've said it. Mike. Hmm, I like it. So do I. Who made that stupid remark, boys never make passes at girls who wear glasses? It's rubbish. So why are you taking off my glasses? To kiss you again? Not until I know what's been happening and what I'm letting myself in for. I see you're still keeping that firm rein on me, Miss Wickham. No suspicious cars about? No. Well, when I arrived, I asked for Dave. And believe it or believe it not, I'm still looking. But now you're a clay pigeon... Mike, what you just told me, it's made me scared stiff. I came to meet Dave. If he's still alive, I'd like to finish what I started. Why are you keeping the book? I'm playing for time. What I want you to do is to go back to England on the next plane and stay there until I send for you. Until death us do part, remember? I want to make sure we get married before the death us do part bit. I'm staying. It's no good the two of us sticking our necks out. I'm already involved. Both our necks are already stuck out, and going to England only means temporary removal from the firing line. Might not be even temporary. All right, then. But I still want you to go to England. You can arrange for your mother to move into my house. I'd rather have her in the hands of my daily help than whoever's looking after her at the moment. And while you're in England, you can buy two OBEVs and bring them back with you on tomorrow morning's flight. You're still the boss. And I intend always to be. Good. Ah, so you're not a woman's liver. Most women, whatever they say, are looking for a man to dominate them. Why do you think 98% of secretaries prefer to work for a male boss? Well, not being a secretary, I wouldn't know. Now to catch your flight. Then I'm going to see a woman of ripe... Abundant charms, rounded lines, and full figure. Uh, well stacked was how I think we described her. Have you any further information about David, Mr. Hayward? No, I haven't, and time is running out. What makes you say that, Mr. Hayward? Because I think you're holding something back. You're closer than anyone to David, and I'm sure he would have tried some way to contact you. No, the phone was tapped. He never trusted the telephone. You're not helping him by keeping things back, Helen. Mr. Hayward, I am not a fool. When this important thing which David has reaches either side, then he will be dispensable. Until they get it, they must keep him alive. Well, that's been my reasoning too, Helga. Why not trust me? Could I? I feel so alone, no one to turn to. Does a book of poems mean anything to you? The Oxford Book of English Verse. That's the one. What do you know about it? David has a little cabin in the Hartz Mountains. I had a feeling he might try to make for it. The border is quite close. He wasn't there, but someone had recently been in the cabin. I sensed it. I can't explain why. Yeah, I understand. We used to go on picnics, David and I. Not far from the cabin, we found our tree. It seems so silly, repeating it. Something so personal, intimate. How can you possibly understand? I do understand. You're in love. It seems so banal, doesn't it? No. Life itself is composed of a great many little things. So often the little things are the most important. I see you do understand. The tree is on the mountain slope overlooking the town. We had found a squirrel was storing nuts in it. We went there often. <laughs> Helga, what did you find the last time you went? Our tree is just over there. They all look alike to me. Pine trees everywhere. But look around this side. I'll scrape a few leaves away from the foot of it. There's a hollow. It's still here. I got it. You see? A canvas bag. And inside? Just a book. A book of verse? Yes. How did you know? The Oxford Book of English Verse. Now, there should be four. Two more arriving shortly. I don't understand. I am just beginning to. Mm -hmm.
Oh, I'm glad to see you. I've had all sorts of imagined disasters happen to you. Did you get the books? In my carrier bag. Everything went all right? Yes. Mother's at your house. Oh, and I, I broke the news to her that we're getting engaged. Mm, five minutes before the wedding. <laughs> I don't believe in long engagements. Well, I'll tell Mother that you swept me off my feet and married me. You can send her a postcard. Now, where are we going? High in the Hearts Mountains. I found a little chapel in the forest with an empty adjoining house. I've rented it. We're going to repeat our rapid right and left turns to remove any pursuers and head for the mountains. And a stream, too. All Maud Khans. And a companion. A companion? Helga, David's good friend. I've got a job for the two of you. Must be an airy place at night. Which is why I arranged for Helga to stay. You'll both be safer here. Smells like Helga's been cooking. Ah, you have arrived. I found a little oven, so I started to cook. Ah, that was delicious. Thank you. Now to work. Here I have four books of verse. We look for a poem containing the words, Late into the night. Then we see how one version differs from the rest. Differs in what way? Ah, that is the question. Here we are, page 707. Mm -hmm. Yes... Now, I've got the book we found in the tree. Helga has the one left in my hotel room. The one you pretended to know nothing about? The very one. And I have the two I brought from England. Lord Byron, and we'll go no more a-roving. Now, let's line the books up on the table, all open at this page. So, we'll go no more a-roving, so late into the night. Looks exactly the same to me. Same number, same place, same wording. Not exactly. Mine's different. So, we'll go no more a-roving, so late into the night. There's a comma too many. What? Look, all the others read, so late into the night, not yes. so, comma, late into the night. Oh, what's in a comma? A micro dot? Haywood speaking. Mr. Haywood, the book, do you have it yet? Yes, but not with me. Have you got the money? We have. We also have something else for you. Listen carefully. Oh! Mike! Give them what they want. Dave! Give Dave. them what they want. Are you all right? Look, what is it they want, Dave? The book. You must let them have it, Mike. It's the only way. Dave! Your friend has given you good advice, Mr. Hayward. If you want the book, you'd better put him on again. It's not a recording, Mr. Hayward. He really is here. But he is in some pain. Listen. <coughs> now you can speak to him again. I can't stand it any longer, Mike. How do I know this isn't a recording? Ask me a question. Uh, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day now? Still the 20 I used to. You might bring some English cigarettes, too. Are you satisfied, Haywood? Now, for your instructions. At precisely 4 a.m., you are to bring the book to the boating jetty on the Weser at a point eight miles north of Minden. You will take the road to Nienborg until you come to an inn called Eulenspiegel. Uh, you must give me time to write it down. Weser. Eight miles north of Minden. Road to Nienburg in Eulenspiegel. A kilometre beyond the inn, there is a road on the left which runs down to the river. Left Take the river. it. The jetty is at the end of it. Come alone. You will be watched all the way. If anyone tries to come with you, your friend will die. Painfully. The Weser is on my left. And I think I can see the inn oil and spiegel in the headlights. By the way, I hope you're still receiving me out there, Robson. Yes, the oil and spiegel. Now, one kilometre further on, there should be the road on the left running down to the riverside. Ah. 
I'm approaching it now. I'm turning left. Hmm, dark and lonely enough down here. Right, this is as far as I can go. The jetty is picked out in my headlights. No one appears to be there. I'm getting out now. All right, here goes. They're coming from behind and in front. Got him where I want him. Now, where are you keeping my friend? No! Right down in the water you go! Talk or drown! in books to Sweden consignment. Did you get that, Robson? My men surrounded the bookshop an hour ago. They'll go straight in. Good work, eh? Well, for a minute, we thought you'd had it. <sighs> so did I. Now, you need a brandy, hot bath and dry clothes, Hayward. And explanations. Oh, you're entitled to them. But uh, first tell me how you managed to take those two KGB East German assassins. They were pros. Yeah, so were the commanders. Of course, you were with David. By the way, he was found alive in a consignment of books for Sweden. Inside a wooden box, all neatly nailed down. The hospital's checking him over now. Oh, that's a relief. Well, as soon as I heard the other footsteps, I threw myself flat, just in time to see guns blaze. Mm -hmm. I shot at the nearest gun flash and hit him. Then I zigzagged in the darkness, and the other one emptied his revolver. I moved rapidly in on him, connected him with a kung fu blow, and followed him into the water. Mm. Just a question of ducking him until he talked. Now, what about you doing some straight talking, Robson? Uh, you could begin by explaining why we had so many Robsons. Oh, to cause confusion. The more the better. They didn't know which one to hit. Though they got the right one first time. He was the one they pushed out of the hotel window. He was in room 409, in the hope Dave could make contact. Dave's code name was also Robson. As you will have gathered, David was a British agent. His businesses were a sort of clearinghouse for information from out of Russia. So what went wrong? Recently, we had quite a breakthrough. One of our agents inside the Soviet Union had for years been compiling a list of potential defectors, men who wanted more freedom of conscience and action. They were all highly placed in important posts. Some were even in the ranks of the KGB. Political dynamite. Well, quite. But somehow they got to know about it. Before we could smuggle it out, our agent was liquidated though not before he deposited the book of verse with a microdot comma in one of our dead letter boxes. And so Dave was sent in to get it? Yes, but he too was blown. He managed to cross the border near the hearts, and then we lost contact. And Dave couldn't come to us because we were all known and under surveillance. Phones were tapped. Our whole network was known to them. So somewhere in your top ranks you have a defector double agent? Hmm, it would appear so. We don't know how much information they have, and what was obviously leaked... So I was brought in. And you were completely clean. Though for a few months we had been preparing you in case of such an emergency. By controlling my company's cash flow. Well, you'll be more than recompensed. How can you make recompense for blackmail? All I can say is you should wait and see. I can't wait. That would be rather a pity. We owe you a great deal. Well, as I was saying, David was a hunted man. It was too dangerous for him to try and pass it on to any established British agent because it was odds on he was blown. They were also moving in and eliminating our contacts. Which is why Robson was pushed out of the window. A complete stranger to them was required. Someone outside. And I fitted the bill. You were perfect. The genuine businessman. And you had booked your seat months ago. David, on the run, dialed me direct from a phone box. A call that couldn't be traced. He would never have appeared at the hotel. 
But there were many ways he could have got the book to. But they got him first. Yes. So we decided we would use you to smoke something out. As an old friend of David's, you were perfect. They couldn't make up their minds about you. When they did, it was too late. Obviously, we helped the confusion by producing more books of verse and more Robsons. We knew they would make him talk. Our aim was to throw them off the scent. Just like a game of cowboys and Indians. But everyone was using real bullets and real corpses. It's a dirty game, Haywood. I admit it. One that you seem to enjoy. But uh, not one you would like to be recruited into? I wouldn't even be blackmailed into it in future. Hmm, pity. I could certainly use you. Yes, use being the operative word. You have a way of using people, Robson. Or whatever your name is. <laughs> For another few weeks I'll keep, Robson. Always variety in the game, Haywood. Oh, talking of variety, I think I've done a variation on the chess game ending. Oh? I left a sealed envelope with the newspaper Bild Zeitung to be opened in case anything happens to me. Or if I don't ring them within a certain period of time. Fascinating information about the little setup the British have around Essen and Dusseldorf. I see. But where is the book with the extra comma? Uh, the book is in the mountains. Uh, but the page it was on has had certain things done to it. <laughs> what? What has happened to it? Well, I worked out that every name on that list is in danger of being dispatched into eternity at any moment. I doubt if they wanted to be on the damn list... But by listing them, you have endangered their lives. You've made them even a bigger threat. You've turned dissenters into potential fifth columnists. What has happened to the microdot? Well, I'm coming to that. I thought about all the trouble it had caused, and I wondered what would happen to it in your hands. You would send it back to London, but London could have a double agent at the moment. Or a year's time, or ten years' time. The names on that list are human beings whose existence would be constantly threatened. What did you do with it? Well, first I burned the page on a lovely old stove. Then I scattered the ashes in a mountain stream. <laughs> Poetic end to something so nasty. Espionage. International prime. You are a traitor! No, Robson. Just too old for cowboys and Indians. But I leave you with this thought. It is a fact that more valuable information is gathered from published material than from old-fashioned spies. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Until death us do part. Until death us do part. worried, Michael. What is it? I didn't want to tell you at the time, but uh, we had two sinister guests at our wedding. Colonel Balakev, tucking himself out of sight behind a pillar, and Mrs. O'Connell. Mrs. O'Connell? Yes. She and Balakev have been watching me like hawks. Balakev, I'm sure, has been giving the orders. The man with a beaming smile and blood on his hands. There's a car coming up the track. Talk of the devils. We may have to make a dash for it into the woods. Not from Mrs. O'Connell. You mean you know her? A girl's aunt ought to come to her wedding. Your aunt? There's something I should explain. But first, Auntie wants to give me a hug. Auntie Claire! Oh, it's me, darling. I was coming this way, so I offered your aunt a lift. He has a bolt hole through the border wire up here, I think. Ah, always she thinks I have an ulterior motive. Tell me. As the only other man at the ceremony beside the groom, does that make me best man? And if so, can I do hug the bride? Certainly not. No heathen, atheistic, communist colonel's going to hug a Christian bride. Not while I'm about, especially when the bride's my niece. You may remember, Michael, the night before you left, I told you my mother's sister was overstaying with us. And you left the office a few minutes earlier than usual? Yes, well, this is Auntie Claire O'Connell, my mother's sister. And when Doris told me you looked like getting yourself into trouble, and I found we were on Truth, the same floor... Truth, Auntie Claire. Well, I was coming to Dusseldorf, and so I got Doris to change my flight as well, so as I could keep an eye on you. Next, you'll be telling me this is Uncle Boris. Uh, this truth business is catching. Unfortunately, I am what you think I am. And there is a convenient entrance and exit into these mountains. As you say, a bolt hole. 
Well, before you bolt, you can take me to the nearest station. I have a lot of demonstration weaving to catch up on. Ah, your aunt is a fine figure of a woman, Mrs. Haywood. And you, Mr. Haywood, did the right thing in disposing of that badly punctuated poem. Printed in Poland. They do a lot of English editions now, but errors do creep in. If you know that much, you'd assume been in possession of the names. Who knows? My own name might have been on it, especially after my association with a female member of an Irish trade delegation. Well, and have you no more fine feelings, Boris? It's time we left the newlyweds alone. Goodbye, Doris. We must talk about you exporting cloth to us, Mr. Hill. Yes, I think I'll stick to the home market, but no government contracts. Bye, Auntie. I think the colonel's fallen for you. I'd be grateful if you'd mention none of this to your mother, Doris, me dear. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <sighs> Last we're alone. Now I'm going to bolt the door. Before we begin our honeymoon, there's just one thing I have to finish off. What's that? Tear out this page, take it to the fire, and watch it burn. I think we can dispense with the scattering on the mountain stream. Poetic license. Come along then, Mrs. H. For two honeymooners, it's also late into the night. You've been listening to Late Into the Night, written especially for radio by William Keener.